What a sweet time of worship already. And we're just beginning. If you have a copy of God's Word before you, and I pray that you do, turn with me to the book of Colossians. Feels a little weird, doesn't it? To not say Leviticus, if you're a guest of ours, we just finished last week, I think uh, it was about 11 months of Leviticus, and today uh, we're going to start a brand new series uh, called Finding Hope for Our Struggles. And over these four weeks, we're going to look at four, what I believe, common struggles that not only impact Christians, but every single person alive today. And so hopefully, what we'll see is how the gospel brings hope and help for us and those around us. And so the four areas we're going to, to look at through this series are identity, which obviously we'll look at today, loneliness, the fear of man, and doubt. So we start today in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, and I'm going to read to verse 4. Here's what the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Colossae. He says, Paul, I'm sorry, that's chapter 1, chapter 3, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. First Baptist Church of Grey Gables, the glass, grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures. Amen. Let's go to the Lord and thank Him for His word this morning. Lord, we do indeed thank You for this, Your precious and errant and fallible word. Lord, our only rule of faith, our authority in, in this life. Lord, we pray that we as Your people would humbly submit to what Your word has for us to hear this morning, that we would come with open hearts, open ears, Lord, willing and ready to obey, uh, eager to, to hear about how your word addresses us in our sin and how we can respond through faith and obedience. Would you be with your people today? Lord, would you be with me and hide me behind your cross, Father? If there's anything I say that is untrue, may it fall to the, to the wayside. But for what is said that is true, would it be received with humble hearts? We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I think it's fair to say that most people spend a good portion of their lives seeking to answer the question, who am I? What is my core identity? Our families, our cultures, those around us have a voice to help us answer that question. They might tell us, this is who you are. This is an identity worth grabbing hold of. And, and really, this searching functionally governs our lives so often. For some of us, the answer to whom am I is, I am what I achieve. For others, it is, I am what I do, the roles that I have. For some, it is, I am what I own or aspire to own. For some, it is, I am how I look. I am what my appearance says about me. There are a number of ways we might answer the question, who am I? And I wonder if you're honest here today, how you would answer that question. I wonder if the way you answer that question actually provides for you stability, hope, security to sustain you through the ups and downs of life. Or if instead your identity always feels like it's on the verge of a collapse. If you often find yourself filled with insecurity or exhaustion, that no matter how much progress you make in, in any area in your life, it just never feels like it's quite enough. Today, we are going to explore together how we can think about identity in a way that can be freeing to us and offer a foundation for a truly fruitful life. This morning, in this brief text, we'll see first a new identity and then second a new orientation that flows from this new identity. And so first, look with me at a new identity. We see this in the text right at verse 1. Paul begins in verse 1 saying, If then you were raised with Christ. And, and here he's actually continuing a line of thinking that he began in Colossians chapter 2 verse 20, the previous chapter where he also says, Therefore, if you died with Christ. And so he's moving from if you've died with Christ to if you've been raised. And then he continues this in verse 3 where he says these words. He says, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. See, Paul was saying, by the grace of God, that, that if you're a believer, you and I are so united with Christ that God sees us as having died with Christ and been raised with him. And so as we trust in Jesus Christ, as we trust in his, his work, his death becomes our death. His resurrection becomes our resurrection. Our old life is over and we are given this new resurrected life, this new identity. And so he addresses this in a very peculiar way. He first addresses our past. He starts by looking at the believer's past. In fact, in one of Paul's other letters, he said it this way in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Speaking of this identity we now have with Christ, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. So it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Paul is communicating that there has been a decisive end to the old life that we have once walked in as unbelievers. And because of that, therefore, we don't have to be captive to the old patterns of sin and rebellion. They don't have to define us anymore. It is now actually possible to fight against and overcome some of those patterns from our past that have absolutely wrecked our lives. In the verses following, Paul goes on to outline some of those areas that now, in the present, we can make progress in. And so he addresses our past, but he also addresses our present. Paul says, your life is hidden with Christ in God. So we've been raised with Christ, and now we live this new life in Him. We are currently living in this eternal life that has already taken hold of us. So what we're experiencing now is simply an improvement of what our life once was. It's, it's not a, an upgrade of our old life, but it is a new life. But even as we're brought into this new life in Christ, we are not yet experiencing in the fullness of what we once will experience. We're experiencing some of it right now in the present, but not all of it. Currently, this life is not fully seen because it's hidden with Christ in God. It's present, it's real, it's before us, but it's not yet fully known. In fact, I was thinking about this this week. Many of you know one of our dear sisters in this church uh, had a long answered prayer of, of needing a liver donation. And we as a church were able to walk alongside her through that process or waiting for a donor while her health declined. And, and yet to, to see her in the hospital before her liver transplant and then to see her shortly after, uh, I, I, we didn't see the new liver. It could not be seen. But within literally hours of this new liver that is hidden, this new life in her began to show itself outwardly, physically in her body. There was a dramatic shift in her color and her countenance and outward appearance because of this new life given by this new liver. And so it is and so much more with our new life that's ours in Christ. It is hidden, not fully seen or known. Friends, it is real. It's surfacing itself. It does bring about transformation within us. In fact, this is what is reshaping our identity. This is the thing that is giving us this new, firm identity in Christ. And so we walk by faith in this world, taking part in this new life, this new identity that Christ has provided. And in this new life, by God's grace, we can make progress. We can, by the power of God, His Holy Spirit dwelling within us, grow in godliness day by day because our life is hidden with Christ in God. So we see our past is addressed, we see our present is addressed, and you probably know what this one is, right? Our future is also addressed in verse 4. Look what it says there again with me. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Friends, Jesus Christ, our King, has promised to return. This is a part of our sure hope as a Christian. And, and when He returns, then finally, the new transformed eternal life that is now ours is fully known, fully experienced. We have died with Christ. We've been raised with Christ. We will, that's a promise, appear with Him in glory. 
See, this is the thing that potentially drives and empowers our lives. How we seek to live here and now, day by day. The verses tell us in the rest of the chapter of exactly how we might fight for godliness and grow in grace. We, we see even a glimpse later on in this passage in verses 9 and 10 of how this is a process that God brings about. Look at verse 9 and 10 of Colossians 3. It says, Do not lie to one another. Why? Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So, so here's what God is doing. He is renewing us to be more and more resembling the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we currently possess this new identity. And by God's grace, we grow day to day more and more to have this new identity govern exactly who we are. This is, by the way, this is the process of Christian maturity. It's sanctification. It is the process of being saved. It is day by day, year by year, yes, decade by decade, growing to be more and more like our King Jesus. And so as Paul writes in this letter, because you've died with Christ and have been risen with Christ, there's now a new way of life, a new way of directing your life. And in this, we see the essential aspect of the Christian life that we sometimes refer to as the union with Christ. The idea is, now that we are in Christ and Christ is in us, we are like Christ and with Christ. And, and although there... That's an easy way to say it. It's simply definitely more challenging to comprehend. This teaching is actually, actually so profound and transformational for us all. We now live, if you were a Christian, a dramatically different story. And yet, I fear it's very easy for us, even as Christians, to lose sight of what the Lord is saying is true of us. With so many other competing stories in our life that are frankly just louder at times, we begin to lose sight of who we are now in Christ. This is what God will accomplish in us in the future. So what we want to do is we want to think deeply about this glorious truth that we have died with Christ. We've been raised with Christ. This changes everything. So again, if you are a Christian, because of this, you have a new identity. You are now a child of God, adopted by the Father, reconciled with God, forgiven freely and fully. You are loved by God with an unbreakable, boundless love. You are now an object of God's mercy and grace. You are now securely kept by your Father. And God has promised He will be at work in you day by day, changing you to be more like Christ. And one day, you will be with your God eternally where there are no more Tears, no more death, no more suffering. Church, this is who you are. And so very importantly, all of this is yours, we have to add, not because of anything that you've done. All of this new identity is yours simply and solely because of what Christ has done on your behalf. The reality is, if it was based on what we've done, then it wouldn't be such good news. Because what if I don't keep doing it? What if I fail? But all of this, this new identity, is grounded in the finished, perfect work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You didn't earn it, and, and therefore, because of that, you can rest in this identity. It's not based on if you succeed at it this week, nor or on how outwardly attractive your life may seem. We can rest in this new, secure identity. But as we look at our verse, this term if here in our verse, it also raises the question for each person on whether or not this has actually happened in your life. See, this, this guaranteed identity is not automat automatically true for every single person simply because they're human. Jesus has come and died and was raised to purchase this free gift of salvation, uh, not so you could simply be aware of it. It's held out to everyone in this room today. And at some point, this free gift, it must be received by faith. It must come to an understanding that I'm, I'm tired of chasing after this lesser identity. I want to trust in the Savior and King Jesus by faith. And if you have not experienced this, I know it's the middle of this. Don't, don't be confused. This isn't the end. 
You can give invitations sometimes in the middle. But if you, you have not experienced this, we would so love for you to, perhaps even today. For those of us who are Christians, I wonder this. I wonder if you think about your friends, co-workers, fellow students, and, and you see this in the world around you, you see how they are searching, they are longing for a secure identity, but they so often lack it. They're searching just like we were. They're, they're running after all sorts of things, and they too are exhausted by the search. There's a place, however, where they could find rest instead of exhaustion. Where even if you're here today and you're looking, you can find hope instead of this frantic pursuit. Augustine said it this way. He said, Thou hast formed us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they find rest in thee. That right there is a perfect description of the human experience. There is this restlessness within, and we long to fill it. And so we chase it everywhere. And for a time, this chase may settle or quiet the restlessness, but it's never enough. Well, this new identity in Jesus Christ is the good news that your coworker, your family member, that your fellow student needs. And the fact is, God has placed you there that you might one day speak of this good news, but also that you might display, even imperfectly, a life that is grounded in a new identity, in a different identity. So let me just get this practically for you. If you're a student here today, and the common identity that you surround yourself is what you achieve. And so when things are going well, you complete the exam, you feel like you've done well, all of you that have this identity of what you achieve, you, you feel some sort of comfort of hope and joy. But what about when you don't do well? What about when your coworker or fellow student fails on the job or exam and their entire identity of you are what you achieve is pulled out from under them? What if your fellow student sees you fail and though perhaps you may dis be disappointed, you may need to rethink the patterns of your own preparation, but you're not crushed. Why? Because your identity is not in what you achieve. That's actually a beautiful picture of the new life that is bound in Christ. So it is in the workplace. If all of your coworkers live out this identity of you are what you do, your role in the workplace, whether you're moving up the ladder or not, defines everything about you. Well, if you're passed over for the promotion... And you're not angry. You're not crushed. You persevere with a good attitude, thankful for the job, celebrating the one who even passed you over. That displays the curious reality that could only be displayed by someone who has a different identity. By the power and grace of God, God has placed you there that we might display this different identity to others. So we have a new identity in Christ. And this new identity then is fueled by, I, I think is refreshed by, a new orientation. A new identity, now a new orientation. Look back at verse 1. Paul says this, he says, Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Those words actually echo some of the teachings of Jesus we're very familiar with. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness... And all these things shall be added to you. In fact, in the context of that, Matthew 6, verse 33, the verses preceding it, Jesus is, is speaking of two different ways of seeking. He says, some seek food or clothing, the things of this world. But he calls us to seek first his kingdom, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. And, and listen, Jesus is saying it's not a question on whether we will seek it or not. Because all of us are seeking something. The entire life is one of seeking something. The question is, who or what are we seeking? So Jesus says, seek the kingdom. And by saying that, seek the kingdom, what he's saying is, seek the king. Which means, seek him. That's why Paul tells us we are to look above because that's where Christ is. He's seated at the right hand of God. We are seeking our king and his reign and we seek him by lifting up the eyes of our heart. 
So the idea here is to seek and keep seeking. This is not a one day momentary resetting, but it is a daily challenge set before us. Ultimately, whatever it is we seek is what truly is at the center of our lives. What I seek will in the end govern my life. What we seek determines how we spend our time, how we put, where we put our resources. And so, what are you seeking today? What are you, where are you looking for life and hope? Friends, we must see that he doesn't say seek what is above in order that you might be raised with Christ. It isn't if, if you just seek it hard enough, then God will love you. No, it's because it's already been accomplished by Jesus that Christ has died, uh, Christ has been raised for you. Now from that, because of that, fueled by that, seek the kingdom. Not in order to earn God's favor. In fact, Paul helps us to see some of how we are to do this in, in verse 2 of our text. He says, set your mind on things above not on things on the earth. So, so one of the fundamental ways that we are to seek these things that are above, to seek Christ, is to, as Paul says, set our minds. It is to think on things that are above. Now, when I say that, this is not purely an intellectual outlook, but it is a fundamental orientation of the heart, the mind, and the will. It is to pour our minds into this And it is to be an ongoing pursuit, a habit of the heart and mind that you and I are to cultivate constantly. So we're to set our minds on the king, on his kingdom, but what are we not to set our minds upon? He says, verse 2, not on things that are on the earth. Some have interpreted this verse to to ask the question, is this calling Christians to live some sort of, of detachment from the world? Do we need to pack it up and Go live in our commune somewhere. Does this call a Christian to withdraw from the world? Some of you in your homesteading, I'm wondering if that's what you have set up there. Um, But the answer is no. This is not some form of escapism. It, It doesn't call us to pull back from the world, but it does give us a lens by which we are to rightly understand this world that we live in. It is to see work relationships, possessions, and the approval of others rightly. It is actually to free us to work hard in this world, to pursue excellence, but not be captive to success. It frees us to engage in relationships in a healthy way, but not captive to relationships. So with this outlook, we understand our home, our hearts, our allegiance is to our king and his kingdom elsewhere. But evidently, we don't just naturally or automatically live out of this new identity. If that were true, then actually this text would be completely unnecessary. The fact is, there are many competing stories that are consistently trying to grab our minds and tell you this is exactly who you are. Never more, I think, in our day and age. They tell us things like, you will never be more than this. For some of you, the story that so often often shapes your life is your family story. Perhaps you've been told this. This this is just how our family is. We've always been like this. You know, your family says, look, all of our family, it's just the, the Irishness in us. We've had these horrible tempers. It's just who we are. We love each other, but we can also be horribly destructive. So, so don't try and get beyond that. It's just who you are. Therefore, perhaps you can't imagine a life where a horrible temper doesn't wreck your life. For some of you, it's the story of your past. You know your own backstory. You know how far you've gone in such destructive areas. And so in your mind, you can't ever imagine moving past your past. You can't ever imagine actually being fully and finally forgiven. You can't ever imagine actually being able to share your story with others without being horribly embarrassed because they would never accept you if they knew. As I mentioned previously, for some of you, it's the story of our culture. You are what you do. Your identity is so wrapped up in success 
and it serves you well in some fronts. You can work longer and harder than anyone else on the job, but it's all for this ever-moving target of achievement. And so on a good day, it fuels work, but on a bad day, it absolutely crushes you. For others, your hope is in what you own or hope to own. It's what you look like. So many other competing identities that are seeking to conform us into their image. Author Melissa Kruger says it this way. She says, the world wants to conform us into its mold. Our flesh craves self-glory. And Satan reminds us of past sins and present failings in an attempt to paralyze our faith. There are many competing forces seeking to take us away from our true identity. In fact, one of the tools that can potentially push us further into these other identities that is so ingrained in the part of our culture is technology. I would say, look, the tool of social media, which is not in and of itself good or bad, can so profoundly fuel or embrace our other identities. It easily tells us this is what success looks like. This is what achievement looks like. This is what happiness looks like. And for some, the desire is to promote a story of perfection. Um, that you are all together. You've got it all together. And so it's a carefully crafted persona online. But for some, the identity we grab hold of is just the opposite. We say, I'm a mess. I'm authentic. I'm far from perfect. And so what we tell is just the opposite, but it's just as much of a trap that our identity is wrapped up in being a person whose life is always sort of frantic. On both sides, the desire is for people to affirm us in that, to approve of us, to like what it is we post. And as we, the audience, scroll through, on the one hand, there's a part of us that, that probably knows this is not real life for them. But the reality is we even still so often measure ourselves by what we see in others. And let me tell you, if you've ever taken family pictures, you know this to be true. In fact, one of my favorite things, you got a Christmas card from us hopefully this year, we took a family picture. One of my favorite things about taking family pictures is to think, and even looking at your family pictures, I just wonder how long did it take to achieve that end result? Right? Most of our beautiful smiling photos we've taken, you might look at online and you might think, well, it's been a really good day in the page house. What a photogenic family. Aren't they perfect? Look at those little angels. They're all smiling. They apparently love each other. Must have been another calm day in the page house. I mean, every day they just roll out of bed smiling and being happy together. But if you knew the backstory of the photo, or even if you just looked at the other side of the camera, right? Put your hands down. Penny, smile. Woohoo! Over here, look at me, look at Daddy. Addie, look over here. Guys, let's get this done, please. Stop crying. No TV if you don't take this picture. Look at the phone. Put your hands down. Don't pick your nose. Stop talking back to me. And then say, cheese. We did, and we, and we produced a very pretty picture, and so we'll share it, and many people will like it and comment saying, what a beautiful family picture. And here's the thing, is, is we're certainly not trying to be liars in what we present. It's simply a photo. But, but there is something that is communicated that could easily be read into. The point is, be careful that we don't watch the stories others tell, and those things actually begin to shape who we are, conforming us to another identity. Regardless, we must be intentional about setting our mind on Christ. Now, here's the final question. How do we do that then? If these are the things to avoid, if these are all these other competing identities, how do we set our minds on Christ? It doesn't happen naturally, but it is a deliberate, intentional directing of our attention, our thoughts, and our actions. And there's a number of ways we can do this. In fact, one of the most central ways that often looks to be the most mundane, antiquated version is, in fact, this gathering. We are a collection of people from different backgrounds gathered together. We sing together. We pray together. We engage in worship through the preaching of God's Word. We interact with each other before and after the service. We receive the sacraments together. We are tethered together with one another. And though it may be at times an unimpressive gathering, it's an intentional choice to set our minds on things above. This time that the word is preached is a tool 
God gives so that by His Spirit our hearts are redirected. These songs that we sing, they're not just tunes, they're a tool that God has decided to use for us to set our hearts and minds upon Him. Church, hear this. Christianity, it is certainly more than attending a weekly gathering like this. But I would also say it's not less than that. If you want to grow as a Christian, one of the wisest and the most fundamental choices you can make is saying, if I am healthy, I will gather with God's people. There's more than I can do than just this, but this is, this is a rhythm that is so fruitful in redirecting and resetting my mind. We also have the opportunity today in this world to regularly take in God's Word, to read the Bible. This hasn't always been true throughout Christianity through the ages, but you can own a copy of the Bible. To set our minds is to take just a small portion of the Scriptures and read it. If you miss a day, right, look, this is, what we have, this is January 1st tomorrow. If you miss tomorrow, you don't have to wait till next January 1st to begin reading your Bible. Just pick it up the next day. But day by day, you're feeding your souls. Day by day, setting your attention on God's Word. And by that, we bring ourselves back to what our true identity is. We also pray together. And in praying, we are looking away from ourselves to others. Join a grow group where you can take time to pray for each other and hear each other's needs. By that, we are resetting our attention on God. Listen, conversations with, with other believers can be so helpful. So maybe today, following the service, just have a conversation and ask someone, what was the takeaway for you from that passage today? What are the potential identities that so often grab your heart? Friends, that, that same electronic device that can feed us other stories can also be used for good. With your phone, you can bring in music into your life wherever you go to help set your mind on things that are above. You can listen to a sermon or a podcast. So many helpful tools use it for good. The, the question for us, though, isn't if we will set our minds. The question, again, is where will we set our minds? All of us will set our minds somewhere today. The question is, where's my heart set today? Then importantly, how will you set your mind on things above tomorrow? What's your plan? Again, don't think this is just going to happen naturally. Is it possible that your mind needs to be reset? Why don't you intentionally set your mind on things that are above? If you're a Christian, you have a transformed, secure identity. Remember, you are made in His image. You are loved by God. You are being conformed day by day to the image of Christ. You are God's child. You are His. Rest in that today. Align yourself, your mind, with that today and this week. May we be scattered to our community to hold up this good news of a secure identity that our neighbors, our friends so desperately need. And if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, I, I just ask you to consider... Could there be an identity that would be secure, that would mean that you can stop chasing these empty, vain things in this world? And could that identity be found in a loving God who sent His Son to die for your sins? I pray that you would find Him if you don't know Him already today. Let's close as we stand with a word of prayer and a song. Gracious Father, we are amazed that Christ would come to die for us, to be raised, triumphant, to provide for us a new secure identity. Lord, I pray for Christians in the room who have been living under the heavy hand of all of these competing identities. Maybe they're overwhelmed. Maybe they're exhausted. Maybe they're frantic. Lord, would you help them to return and rest and the work of Christ, and all that that means for us. Lord, I pray for some who are not Christians here this morning, that they might see the beauty and hope available because of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we even prepare to sing this hymn of response, would you help us sing with hearts of joy? As we bow our hearts to you, as we recognize that these are not empty, vain tunes and words that are to be sung Lord, as, as some nomad trying to find our way. 
But this is a purpose, intentional time that we have to set our minds on things above. We pray it would be beneficial that you work through your church to give us great hope in the midst of our struggle of finding out who we are. Father, that our identity would simply be, we are hidden in Christ. And it would be a joy to us. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing this hymn in response together. As we come now to the time of our invitation, which is the closing of our service, um, I pray particularly if you're a Christian here that you would uh, find your identity, reset your mind on the things that are above, that you would recognize the gift that's been given to you in one another as you have this opportunity to encourage one another towards this. This is not something that actually is meant to be done alone. It is a, a joint endeavor as we pursue the Lord, as we're reminded uh, of our identity constantly by our brothers and sisters who are also pursuing the same path. And so if you're here this morning, maybe this has just been a struggle for you. I know it's been a struggle for many, and, and particularly these difficult seasons of life, to find our identity in all of these other places. Let me just encourage you to confess that to a believer, to have that conversation with each other afterwards, to find somebody and say, listen, I, just, I struggle with this, and would you pray with me? Would you encourage me? Would you remind me that my life is hidden in Christ and that I am His, that I've died with Him and been raised with Him, and that would be the defining characteristic of my life. It would be when I'm asked who I am, it would be that one, who, the one who is, was a sinner and who is a sinner, but is a sinner saved by grace, by a loving and gracious Savior. So if you're here this morning and that's, uh, you're a Christian, then, then that call to respond, to engage in worship in that way. But if you're not a Christian this morning, I, I wonder again if you, uh, if you would aim to seek that identity. Listen, let me remind you the story of the gospel. Uh, we believe that according to God's word, the, the Lord created this world and everything in it in, in six days. And he created it good as a loving, good creator. And the chief of all his creation was man. He created man above all the other creation to be made in his image to perfectly display his goodness and righteousness to the world, to lead all creation in the worship of who He is as an expression of Himself. Uh, that's a beautiful story. God designed it that way, that man would be in right relationship with God and fellowship with Him, and yet uh, man had sinned against God. They rejected God's good and righteous design and God's purpose for their life, and instead redirected, reoriented their purpose to be centered on the creation to reject the glory of God, instead uh, exhort and, and exalt the glory of man. And so they began to do this. They, they live out this life. Man is born in sinful rejection of a holy God who created them. They're born with the sense that they are the most important thing in all of the universe. And they serve themselves and the things around them. And, and the reality is, as, as, as normal and common as that is among human nature, it is treason against our Creator. And it is deserving of his just wrath. And so uh, the Bible tells us that the penalty for this rejection of God's good and righteous design um, is death. And not just death physically, while we experience death in this world, but death spiritually. An inability for us as human beings to be in a right relationship with God because of our sinful nature. To left to our own devices, if the story were to end there, we would be in utter doom and peril. There would be no hope for today. You would experience the just and righteous wrath of your Creator, and there's not a one of us that can look at Him and say He's unjust because we have all broken His law each and every day. But praise God, the story doesn't stop there. Uh, this, this good and loving God made a plan to send forth His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be fully God and fully man. Fully man so He could pay the penalty for us and be a righteous sacrifice. And fully God so that it would be an eternal sacrifice. It would never have to be done again. And Jesus lived a perfect life where you and I reject God's good and righteous design. Jesus lived it out perfectly. He didn't disobey His Father at any point in time during His life. But He lived His life unto the glory of the Lord. So uh, Him never sinning and never earning the uh, just wrath um, condemnation of His Father willingly went and bore it for us. For those of us who do deserve it. But not only that, Jesus gives, he imparts a righteousness, reputes a righteousness to us that he has earned. So, so his status, the Lord's status, Jesus' status becomes ours and ours became his on the cross. He taking upon our sin, being punished for what we've done, and we taking apart what He's earned in His righteous standing before the Father, so that God the Father now no longer looks at us and sees us in our sinful stead. Instead, He sees us hidden in Christ in His righteousness. Now, that's great news. It's great news if you believe. It's great news if you receive that good news by faith. And so uh, how this becomes attained by you is, is very simple, but it's also extremely difficult. You must first repent of your sins. That is, that is acknowledge that you are indeed a sinner who has broken God's law, committed treason against the Most High King. 
but, but turn from that status and instead long to pursue your King Jesus. Redirect and reset your mind towards him and recognize that he is your king and ever strive to live for him. Not perfectly, but, but with, an, with, a, with a direction towards him as king. But it's not just that. It's believing in his finished work. Not just believing that it's true, but, but trusting that it was sufficient. His sacrifice, his death, burial, resurrection, they were all sufficient for you to be saved. That the only reason that you have this new identity is because of what Christ has done. And then the beauty of the gospel is you, who are a sinner and who will remain a sinner, can be seen as righteous by your creator because of his work and his love for you. If you haven't made that decision in your heart today, if you haven't turned by faith to this living God, let me encourage you to do that today. There's, there's no prayer particularly that you need to pray. You simply just call out to God. Admit yourself to be a sinner. Trust in His finished work on the cross. Tell Him that you believe upon Him. And then go on trusting Him each and every day as long as you live. That's what it means to be a Christian. I want to invite you, if you've never responded to the gospel by faith, that you would do that today, that you would tell someone in this room, that's what I want to do, that's what I've done. I believe myself now to be a Christian. I've heard the good news of the gospel, I've been convicted of my sin, and I, I want Jesus, I want him to be king over my life. We'd love to share with you and celebrate that with you today, if the Lord has so worked in your heart.